for this video we are going to be looking at the final part of aerobic respiration which is known as oxidative phosphorylation together with chemiosmosis before we go into uh, the process there is a bit of revision that we have to cover all right because this process is a little bit complicated now the first thing i want to talk about was in the previous videos, I'm just putting it on the screen here as you can see, um, in one of the previous videos, I said that the main way to produce ATP is through a process known as chemiosmosis. And chemiosmosis involves uh, an enzyme known as ATP synthase. It's a membrane enzyme. Membrane enzyme meaning to say it's an enzyme, but it's attached or embedded in a membrane. It cannot just freely move around in the cytoplasm. And the way this enzyme functions is, uh, as long as the enzyme is given uh, adequate energy, the enzyme is able to accept ADP and phosphate, and then it's able to synthesize ATP. For the enzyme to function, it needs to be powered by hydrogen ions. As you can see in that diagram, hydrogen ions will diffuse down the concentration gradient from a higher hydrogen ion concentration to a lower hydrogen ion concentration. It powers the ATP synthase and thus the ATP synthase is able to produce ATP. This is the main way our cells produce ATP, by the way. So that's the first thing we covered. So the second thing we want, we want to talk about was, I told you that oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis happens in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So if I'm drawing out a mitochondrion over here, you can see the matrix, the cristae. The cristae are the finger-like structures meant to increase the surface area of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay. Now, the blue color area that I'm highlighting there is known as the intermembrane space. The intermembrane space is just an area between the outer membrane and inter inner membrane. This is important. And I'm uh, coloring the matrix as green in color. Now, please don't judge my coloring. Yes, I know it's not hitting the lines. Okay, <laughs> You can see those gaps, uh, those gaps of whites and such. But yeah, it's, it's kind of difficult to color it in. Um, anyway, so uh, I had one of a student, I had one of my students who said, teacher, can you not, because uh, some of my students were like, I, I guess you can say they have some sort of OCD, if you can call it that, where if they see me not color it properly, they, they cringe, but who cares? Anyway, so um, the thing that I want to cover here is I want to, okay, I want you to know where the ATP synthase is located. As you can see, I drew out an ATP synthase there. Remember, it's a membrane enzyme, right? So where exactly is the ATP synthase found? It is actually embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Now, some students assume that the mitochondrion only has one ATP synthase. No, the mitochondrion can have a multitude of ATP synthase as long as it's within the inner mitochondrial membrane. That is why the inner membrane is folded, because the more folded it is, the more ATP synthase it can contain, right? And remember, how does the ATP synthase function? The ATP synthase can only function when hydrogen ion diffuses through it. So in this case, the intermembrane space must have a higher hydrogen ion concentration and the matrix must have a lower hydrogen ion concentration, not the other way around, so that the protons or the hydrogen ions can diffuse through the ATP synthase, power the ATP synthase, and thus ATP can be synthesized. So the question here is as follows. So the first question was, where, what is the main way we produce ATP? We do it through chemiosmosis, and we use the ATP synthase. Where is the ATP synthase located? In this case, it's located in the inner mitochondrial membrane. How does it function? Hydrogen ions will have to diffuse down the concentration gradient from the intermembrane space to the matrix through the ATP synthase. And as long as that happens, the ATP will be continuously synthesized. 
Then comes the question, okay, so where does the hydrogen ion come from, right? So this is a very simplified diagram that I'm drawing here, okay? You can see that. Uh, uh, okay, I know the ATP synthase has a more complicated structure, but I'm just simplifying it over here. So that uh, in the exam, usually they'll draw ATP synthase out like this. So you have the inner membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer on its own. Uh, it has the blue color area, intermembrane space, and also the matrix, okay? Right, that's good. Now, so this is where the video is all about, where we are going to talk about how exactly do we generate that proton gradient, okay? Now, to talk about that, we first have to cover a structure which is nearby the ATP synthase, and that is known as the electron transport chain, also known as the ETC. If I'm not mistaken, you can say ETC in the exam, by the way. So that's fine. All right. So, and the ETCs are also located, usually located next to every ATP synthase. So before we talk about oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis, we then also have to cover what exactly does the ETC do, electron transport chain. It's in the name. The electron transport chain is a series of membrane proteins, all right? And what it does is it just transports electron, okay? So it accepts electron and passes the electron from one protein to another. And as the electrons are passed along the chain, the electrons release a little bit of its energy. Because at the beginning, the electron was full of energy. And as the electron gets passed around, the electron loses its energy. Now, you might be thinking, oh, this is a bad thing. The electron is losing energy. But no, it's actually quite good because that energy will power some of the proteins in the electron transport chain, as I have represented here. And because it powers the ETC, some of those proteins are now able to pump hydrogen ions against the concentration gradient. And it pumps it into the intermembrane space. So you might be thinking, okay, but why the hell is all this happening? Well, very simple. If you pump hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space, compare the hydrogen ion concentration in the matrix and the um, intermembrane space. The intermembrane space has a higher hydrogen ion concentration. The matrix has a lower hydrogen ion concentration. So what process can happen? The hydrogen ions diffuse through the ATP synthase through chemiosmosis. And by doing that, ATP can be synthesized. Then, of course, comes the question, where exactly does the hydrogen ion come from? Where does the electron come from? Because for the ETC to function, it needs electrons, it needs hydrogen ions, right? So, we've talked about it. Remember, when we studied glycolysis, link reaction, and Krebs cycle, the organic molecule, like glucose, was constantly broken down. And as it was broken down, it released out hydrogen, and the hydrogen was accepted by reduced NADs and reduced FADs. So this is where the reduced NADs and reduced FADs are going to be used. So the first step in oxidative phosphorylation is the fact that the reduced NAD has to be oxidized. What does it mean by oxidized? It will release the hydrogen atom not hydrogen ion hydrogen atom first be careful and when it releases the hydrogen atom what happens to the reduced nad the reduced nad is reconverted back into nad which is like a carrier which is empty the nad can go back to the link reaction and Krebs cycle or glycolysis and carry more hydrogen okay if it wanted to but let's focus on the hydrogen atom right now that hydrogen atom is the one that will split to become hydrogen ions and electrons. Then you might be thinking, oh, okay, yeah, we were just talking about electrons and hydrogen ions earlier. That is where they come from, by the way. Now, the hydrogen atom does not spontaneously split, by the way. One of the proteins in the ETC helps that process happens, but we don't have to go through that in detail. Um, so what happens to the electron? the electron will then move along the ETC. And remember, the electron had high energy, and that electron will release its energy along the ETC. But for the exam, you can just say, the electron moves along the ETC and powers it. That's good enough. 
And as it powers the ETC, the ETC or the electron transport chain will pump the hydrogen ions from the matrix into the intermembrane space. And when it pumps it into the intermembrane space, look at the concentration of the hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space and the matrix. What do you notice? The hydrogen ion concentration or the proton concentration in the intermembrane space is higher, in the matrix is lower. Thus, number five, you have created a proton gradient. A proton gradient just means that one area has a higher hydrogen ion concentration, one area has a lower hydrogen ion concentration. And as is with most things in the universe, they will always want to strive towards equilibrium, which means to say they want to diffuse through something, okay, to rebalance the gradient. So the, what does the hydrogen ion do? The hydrogen ion diffuses through the ATP synthase, and that process is called chemiosmosis. And as long as hydrogen ions diffuse through the ATP synthase, the ATP synthase is powered and ATP is synthesized. That is what happens in this case. So you might be thinking, oh, okay, this is, this is simple enough. Now, the final step of this process in oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis, remember, if you notice something, we have only, we, we have been talking about aerobic respiration. And aerobic respiration is all about using oxygen. But up until now, I've not mentioned anything about oxygen gas at all. If you've noticed, in, our, in my video on glycolysis, link reaction, Krebs cycle, never once did I mention oxygen gas, even though oxygen is super important. You see, the role of oxygen in aerobic respiration is quite anticlimactic, okay? The oxygen is only important for the final part or the final step, where Oxygen accepts the electron from the ETC and it also accepts the hydrogen ion to form water. So the electron from the ETC will bind to the oxygen. The hydrogen ion in the matrix will also bind with oxygen and it becomes water. In the exam, if a question asks you what is the role, role of oxygen or the function of oxygen, you just have to say it's the final electron acceptor. Now you might be thinking, that's it. Is that all oxygen does? Yes, that's basically what it does. Uh, but that does not take away from the importance of oxygen, by the way, because if the oxygen is not there, uh, oh, it's going to be difficult. You will die. I mean, obviously, right? If you stop breathing or in, if you are in an environment where there's not enough oxygen, I don't need to tell you what will happen. But we will talk about uh, that later in the next video. But for now, okay, this is the entire process of oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis. Let's do it again, simplified version. The reduce, we start off with the reduced NAD, and the reduced NAD will be oxidized to become hydrogen atoms and NADs. The hydrogen atom splits to become hydrogen ion and electron. The electron moves through the ETC, and it provides energy to the ETC. And when the ETC has energy, the ETC will pump hydrogen ions against the concentration gradient into the intermembrane space. This creates a proton gradient between the intermembrane space and matrix. And the hydrogen ions or protons will diffuse through the ATP synthase through chemiosmosis, causing the production of ATP to happen. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor where it will receive electron together with hydrogen ions to form water. To summarize everything we've learned in aerobic respiration, glucose is broken down in glycolysis to form 2-pyruvate. The 2-pyruvate is broken down to become 2-acetyl-CoA in link reaction and the 2-acetyl-CoA or the acetyl group is broken down completely in Krebs cycle. These processes will produce two reduced NAD in uh, glycolysis, two reduced NAD in link reaction, and six reduced NADs in Krebs cycle, together with two reduced FADs. And it also produces NET2 ATP in glycolysis, NET2 ATP in Krebs cycle. We've covered that before. Those reduced NADs and reduced FADs will go towards the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, where those reduced hydrogen carriers will become oxidized. They will release the hydrogen atoms 
and then look at what happens to the reduced NADs and reduced FADs, they are regenerated. Okay, and then the hydrogen atom splits to become hydrogen ion and electron. Electron moves to the ETC. ETC pumps hydrogen ion against the concentration gradient into the intermembrane space, creates a proton gradient. Hydrogen ion diffuses through ATP synthesis and ATP is synthesized. And finally, the electron in the ETC will be accepted by oxygen, which is the final electron acceptor, and that forms water. Now, I want you to notice with that regenerated NADs and regenerated FADs, where do they go back? They will then go back to glycolysis, link reaction, Krebs cycle, because they have to carry more hydrogen atoms towards the inner membrane. So this, so the, remember, the, the FADs and NADs are transporters. They are carriers. They carry the hydrogen atom to the inner membrane, release the hydrogen, go back like a car or a taxi or an Uber or a Grab, whatever, and carry more hydrogen atoms over and over again. This is the summary of everything in aerobic respiration.